I did it. I watched Tiger King. So many of you wanted me to watch this. I got some fairly demanding messages, like all caps, watch Tiger King, which I don't understand why. Presumably you want me to watch it so I make a video about it, but like, what do you think? Like, of course I'm just going to say, yeah, what they're doing is bad. Don't breed and sell tigers and just exploit them and put them in these awful conditions. Yeah, don't do that. But obviously it's not really about that. I mean, it is, but yeah, I, I was actually pleasantly surprised, which is a weird thing to say if you've, if you've seen the series, you know, going into it, I thought the focus was going to be on the tigers and on the abuse. And I thought there was going to be lots of footage of abuse and I did not want to see that, but that is not at all what this is. The takeaway message, at least partially is that, yeah, it's, this is not okay and this is abuse, but not a lot of abuse is shown. I mean, you see the animals and the conditions that they're living, which are not terrific, but I don't know. I'm kind of not jaded. That's not the right word, but if you've seen factory farm footage, it's, I don't know, a million times worse, a, a trillion times worse than anything shown in this movie, truly. Um, so yeah, I, I guess my expectation when someone says there's a lot of abuse in the film is way worse than, than what is actually shown. So yeah, I was pleasantly surprised that there wasn't a ton of abuse. Um, I managed not to cry until the last, I think, five to 10 minutes. It's this brief little thing, but Joe Exotic, the, the Tiger King, uh, talks about these chimpanzees that he had for 10 years, I think he says, and they lived in cages next to each other and presumably never got to really interact except for through these these bars. And eventually they were uh, given, I think, to a sanctuary or whatever, and they had this big area to play in and be together. And he saw footage of them and they're hugging. And he says, you know, did I deprive them? Did I deprive them of that for, for 10 years? And that's when I, you know, yeah, you did. And yeah, and apparently I'm not alone in being uh, a little bit confused by what the <laughs> what the show turned out to be, which is partially my fault. I didn't read the little, you know, the, the subtitle. It's Tiger King Murder, Mayhem, and Madness, which I think already suggests that it's going to be more than just, you know, it's going to be more about the Tiger King himself probably than, you know, the exploitation of the tigers, right? But um, anyway... Carol Baskin, the CEO of Big Cat Rescue in Florida, it's a sanctuary in Florida. It's a, she's a big part of the documentary. Um, she was fairly confused, disappointed as well. When the directors of the Netflix documentary Tiger King came to us five years ago, they said they wanted to make the big cat version of Blackfish that would expose the misery caused by the rampant breeding of big cat cubs for cub petting exploitation and the awful life the cats lead in roadside zoos and backyards if they survive. Spoilers, kind of, from, from here on out, I guess. I don't know. Can you spoil a documentary? Is that a thing? Do people get upset about that? I don't know. But um, yeah, so it's it's mostly about the people, mostly Joe Exotic, the Tiger King, and Carol Baskin, again, the CEO of uh, Big Cat Rescue, and this kind of feud that they have that eventually leads to Joe Exotic being sentenced to 22 years in prison. So I say pleasantly surprised again, because, you know, I didn't want to watch a whole lot of animal abuse. Um, but truly, my first reaction upon really before even finishing it was disappointment, I guess, because I did kind of want the focus to be on the industry, on this trade, on the exploitation of these tigers, on the lives of these animals, on captivity in general, on people like Carol, again, she is a big part of the film, but not this aspect, which is that she went from someone who bred these animals, who profited off of these animals, letting people play with them and whatnot, to being totally against that, no longer breeding them and actually wanting the practice banned in the U.S. And Joe Exotic seemingly going the other way, you know, from believing that it is wrong to breed these animals and for them to live in, you know, Oklahoma, where his zoo, quote unquote, um, was located to seemingly not giving a shit about them at all and just using them to make money. It's by far the most interesting part to me of the whole documentary. 
And again, it's only briefly mentioned as far as Carol goes, and they actually show some of this footage of a tape that she made a long time ago. It's basically a how-to, how to hand raise these tiger cubs. And it's it's very creepy and it's very weird. And they don't even have any um, current day footage, you know, asking her. They didn't even seem to interview her, or at least it didn't make it, you know, to the to the film asking her about this. And yeah, they don't even ask her about her past with regard to breeding these animals and how she changed and why she changed. That is the most interesting thing to me. And again, it's only briefly mentioned. And then the Joe Exotic part, you know, his whole uh, apparently believing that it's bad to breed these, breed these animals, it's not mentioned until the last few minutes of the last episode. And it's not, it's not explored at all. Now, the co-creators say basically that Carol's lying, that uh, they never said that it was supposed to be a blackfish about cats, that she knew this given all of the stuff that she was interviewed about that wasn't about the cat's personal stuff, like the um, mysterious disappearance of her husband. But obviously the showrunners didn't go into this planning on it be about a murder for hire plot. <laughs> like they talk about in this interview, wanting to go into more detail about the tigers and inbreeding and the uh, congenital defects that result from that but they essentially couldn't weave it into the story. They're filmmakers, so of course they realized that the the better story, so to speak, was the story that focused on Joe and all of these people surrounding him, you know, these just crazy, you know, cast of crazy characters. Um, obviously they realized that that made for a better story and a better show, uh, you know, focusing on the realities of this trade, a story that's just, you know, completely about abuse. It's just bogged down by abuse, you know, might turn people off. I mean, what did I say? Like, I, if this show was all about that, if that first episode was all just showing animal abuse, I wouldn't have kept watching it. Not that it's a happy story by any means. Um, and not that there isn't abuse. There is a lot of abuse, but it's mostly talked about rather than shown, which I do appreciate. Um, and also, I would say most of the abuse you know, it's really focused on, I think, the abuse of the people rather than the cats. Like Joe Exotic's obsession with very young men, getting them in these situations where they can't really leave. You know, he doesn't want them to have a job. He doesn't want them to leave the perimeters. He doesn't even want them to go visit family. He wants them to be completely dependent on him so that they will stay. Doc Antle, who's another big cat exploiter. Um, he's in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Uh, he has... A similar kind of thing, but it's a bunch of girlfriends and, you know, their employees there. Again, it's very, it's very culty. It's very weird. Um, the interview that they do with the former girlfriend slash employee is super disturbing. The biggest disappointment to me or, or the, the part I hated the most and it made me extremely uncomfortable was the focus, and I think there's almost like an entire episode focused on it, is Carol's husband who went missing and this idea that she did it and then fed his body to her tigers. She's never been charged with anything. So making this such a big focus of the show just made me really uncomfortable. And I understand they felt like they had to touch on it because Joe Exotic was so obsessed with it. Obviously, Carol Baskin became enemy number one to him because she is fighting for what he's doing to be banned. She is fighting for his trade to be illegal. So of course he hates her and he's very paranoid and very egotistical and whatever. And so he takes it to this extreme where he's just constantly talking about her and making videos about her and, you know, making dummies that are supposed to represent her and blowing them up and all this horrible, horrible stuff. So I get that because that's such a big part of him and I'm sure they're filming him and he's constantly talking about how much he hates her and everything. Like, of course they have to talk about it. But the fact they spent so much time interviewing people who obviously thought that she did it and are trying to make a case for her being this horrible, evil person and very little time on her response to all of that it made me feel like, you know, at best, I was being encouraged to pick one side or the other. And at worst, 
that I was being led in a particular direction. I.e., yeah, she did it. She murdered her husband and fed him to tigers. Like, fuck off with that shit. You know, this is a woman who is still alive. She is not dead. She is still alive. I'm sure she has already received a lot of harassment for this because she's already, you know, a, a public figure, right? Um, <laughs> I don't know. I would just feel horrible doing something like this knowing that she is absolutely going to receive more harassment because of this show. It sucks. In any event, Carol did respond to all of this um, in a blog post on the Big Cat Rescue website. So if you want to hear her side of it, you can. And I do find it interesting going by these interviews with the director, director Eric Good. It's pretty clear that he doesn't have a whole lot of love for Carol. The other thing I would say about all these people is that there was a lack of intellectual curiosity to really go and understand or even see these animals in the wild. Certainly, Carol really had no interest in seeing an animal in the wild. The lack of education, frankly, was really interesting. How they had built their own little utopias and really were only interested in that world and the rules they had created. There are other real questions that arose about Carol and her past with cats and her evolution. I would oftentimes ask her why, if you want to be out of business in 10 years, build a gift shop that's 10 times bigger. I think one of the more important questions was, if your mission is to tell people not to keep tigers and lions and leopards and jaguars in cages and bobcats and so forth, why do it? Why not really ask yourself a hard question and say, is it more humane to keep a tiger in a cage pacing neurotically for the rest of its life, or is it more humane to humanely euthanize that animal and put it out of its misery? At the end of the day, the best sanctuaries are places like the Performing Animal Welfare Society in Northern California, where he really provides his tigers large spaces. So it seems to me that Good is not super sold on Big Cat Rescue, on the mission of Big Cat Rescue, that he doesn't think the tigers there are living, you know, the best life possible within captivity, that they could have you know, more space or whatever. I mean, citing another sanctuary, quote, where they really provide tigers large spaces, I think makes that pretty clear. So, you know, <laughs> maybe he just didn't really give a shit whether or not the series led to more harassment of Carol. I don't know, but I just find it extremely irresponsible. Speaking of Big Cat Rescue, I was actually somewhat familiar with them. I had maybe a few years ago started watching them because, you know, whatever videos show up and I like tigers as much as the next person. They're cool, you know, and it's like, oh, they're a rescue and they're actually talking about not breeding these animals. And you know what? I want to say it was from them that I actually learned about the uh, whole white tiger thing and how you create white tigers through all this inbreeding and seeing what happens to some of them. Are all accredited zoos? Is it you can't have white tigers anymore? Maybe I'm wrong about that. But um, yeah, I believe it was through Big Cat Rescue that I actually learned about that. So like a lot of people, you know, I had seen their videos, really impressed by the the enclosures, the size of the enclosures, the no contact policy with the cats. Um, yeah, I was really shocked to, to hear Big Cat Rescue which comes up within, I think, just the first few minutes of the show. And was like, wait, what? Big cat, what? Wait, that big cat rescue? Why is it, what? <laughs> Why is this part of the story? I'm so confused. Obviously, I can't speak to the nature of the sanctuary itself. I've never been there and I'm not an expert in tiger care or, or anything like that or wild animals, but they do have like overwhelmingly positive reviews from volunteers and guests. There's also this really interesting, pretty positive post on Reddit from a former employee who talks about, you know, there's a part in the film where it, I don't know, it's played like it's, it does come across really weird, honestly, where they show all of the different people working or volunteering at Big Cat Rescue, which is a non-profit, um, wearing different color t-shirts. And they kind of go into explaining it, but not really. And this former employee goes into further detail saying like, it, no, it makes sense why, the, why there, there are different colors, right? If you're wearing a certain color, it means that you've been here long enough that you you know, actually can interact with the bigger cats because when you first get there, they're not just going to let you go and feed the tigers. They're going to put you with the the servals and the, the smaller cats. They don't explain any of that in the film and it's just presented as um, almost like it's supposed to be a counter 
not a counter, but like, like it's similar to what Joe and Doc Antle are doing with their weird kind of culty stuff. Well, like, look, she's got all these different color t-shirts. Isn't that weird? N no. And oh, she doesn't pay these people. Well, yeah, it's a charity and they're volunteers. And there are people who work there who do receive pay, but like, you know, pretty typical for charities. It's really, they just kind of let Joe say these things. And sometimes there's no counter narrative. It comes across to me like they just don't like Carol. They just don't like Big Cat Rescue. So they're not really going to go out of their way to counter things that are coming out of this criminal's <laughs> This criminal's mouth. They show this day where there are tons and tons of people there. And it looks like, I mean, it makes it look like it's a zoo almost, right? And it's very like, whoa, is that what this is? Like, I was watching it like, oh, I didn't know that's what Big Cat Rescue was. This is weird. Well, if you read the blog post from Carol, according to her, this is like a once a year thing that they do. It's some sort of, I forgot what she called it, but it's this little event thing. That's not typical for them. You know, I'm not saying that they don't give any time to Carol to talk about things. They they do. They absolutely do. But there are certain things where they don't. And um, it's glaringly obvious because why would you not have her talk about this and maybe explain, you know, it just comes across as intentional to me. I can't help but see it any other way. And I'm not saying that, you know, Carol Big Cat Rescue is perfect or anything like that. You know, I don't know. Again, I don't know a whole lot about them. I will say that I did stop watching their videos um, and I've never given money to them and I never would give money to them, to be honest, uh, because what do cats eat? You know, it. it's not like they're feeding them broccoli. I personally would not feel good about giving my money to an organization just so they can keep a few cats in cages and feed them frozen rabbits. I, I don't think that's a great use of money, quite frankly. We have billions of cows and chickens and pigs and turkeys and fish and other animals living in the worst conditions imaginable. I just would way rather give my money trying to end that, trying to end factory farming. But obviously saying that both Joe and Carol are the same is ludicrous. And this is, it's something that Joe says, of, of course he says it, right? But also other, I've seen other people saying it. They've come out of watching this show with the idea that they're both the same actually. Joe was breeding these animals, selling these animals to whoever, ripping babies away from their mother as soon as possible. Carol is not doing any of that. She's not breeding these animals. She's not even allowing people to pet them. She's not making money off of, wow, look how cool these animals are. Come on, come see them. And oh, look, I have little tiny baby cubs. Come on, come on, come on. Not only that, not only is she not doing that, but she's actively working to end private ownership of cats to have this band. They are not the same at all. It's just, man, people really like Joe. And it is baffling to me. I understand having sympathy. You know, I think that's good. We should always try to find sympathy for virtually anyone, really. I, I think, I don't think many people are beyond help or can't change. I think that is rare, I would hope. Otherwise, wow, <laughs> it's not, not a great world, you know what I mean? So I have no problem with people being sympathetic and hoping that he comes out of his jail time with a different outlook, you know, and he actually sees maybe going to jail does really make him see how awful it is to keep these creatures in cages and all of the other terrible things that he did. Um, that would be great. But it's more than just the silly little memes. Like some people really do seem to think that he is, well, even the director who has is not a fan of Joe, you know, says he's disappointed to see him come out as like this anti-hero. Like, no, he's, he's, he's bad. He's really bad. And he's got to do a lot, a lot to make up for everything that he's done over the last decades. As I mentioned earlier, Carol, 
Um, wasn't always this way, you know, uh, fighting for animals, not wanting these animals to be in captivity. She and her former husband used to breed them, used to play with them, all of that stuff. Uh, but at some point she changed. And again, I just wish they had talked about that. I wish they had asked her why. I believe they do talk about it on her website, but I don't know. I just don't understand why that's not in the in the series. That's, yeah, that's the most interesting part to me, but that's just me. I don't really find it interesting hearing about these psychopaths just using people over and over again, I'm talking about Jeff <laughs> explicitly, like, you know, to be direct, like that guy. Wow. You know, a lot of people in the series are, well, a lot of the people surrounding Joe are poor and they're trying to make the best of the situation that they're in. And to give Joe some credit, you know, he's going up to people who have nothing and, giving them a job. Now, you know, whether his intentions are entirely pure, no, probably not. But he did do at least some good for these people who just had nothing. And you see, you know, like um, Rinky, I think was his name. And who was the other one with the blonde hair? They obviously cared about these tigers. And they obviously hated that the conditions that they were in and not having enough food sometimes. And that, you know, now they don't get to see their their tigers anymore you know they don't get to play with them anymore even if we see that as wrong like i don't think they are bad people i think they just were put in a in a horrible situation you know and of course uh john finlay and travis put into this situation where they're just totally dependent on someone and yeah it's it's awful and poor travis that was absolutely shocking. Most of the people are not, are not psychopaths or anything like that. It's, and even Joe, I don't think, I mean, I'm not anyone, so this doesn't mean anything, but you know, he's, he's got an ego certainly, and he's very paranoid and probably narcissistic, but, um, you know, the Jeff guy, oh my God, that guy, he just, he finds people, he knows what he can get out of them, he gets it out of them. As soon as they realize they're being taken, it's too late. And then he moves on to someone else. And it's just, wow. And man, that part where uh, Lauren is pregnant and he says, you know, something about her giving birth and then we'll get her right back in the gym or something like that. And Doc Antle as well. Just, you know, wow. That's, those are scary. Those are legitimately scary people. Anyway, I talked earlier about the... Um, Joe being completely different at some point, you know, years ago. And again, this is in just the last few minutes of the last episode. They include a clip of him several, several years prior. It doesn't say when this was filmed, but it was soon after or before he opened his, you know, zoo, quote unquote. He's being interviewed by a local news station. And he says, these are very dangerous animals, very beautiful animals that have a place in the world. And that's in Africa and Asia and India, not in Oklahoma. The state needs to pass laws that this breeding has got to stop. To go from that to shooting a chicken because the chicken crowed too much. Maybe he was lying, you know, in that clip. Maybe he never really cared about breeding these big cats or ending the trade, or he thought that it never really would, but it would sound really good if he said it. Or maybe he did, but, you know, as I've argued before, anytime you put a price tag on a creature, on a sentient being, exploitation of that animal cutting corners to make more money is a possibility. And in Joe's case, this person who is obviously very full of himself, he craves attention. He wants to be this sort of tiger king, right? Um, I think the the exploitation of these am animals, animals, of these animals, you know, losing his love for this, these animals, um, losing his humanity really was you know, virtually inevitable. They became, I think, just a uh, symbol of power and, and greatness for him. I think it's why he loved the Tiger King, you know, title so much. And it's probably the same for a lot of these people who are so obsessed with having tigers and other big animals. It's just this whole power thing. Oh, man, it's weird. I don't even, I don't even understand the, like, petting baby tigers thing and, like, taking a picture with them. 
it's just, they're just like bigger kittens. You can't go pet a fucking kitten? Does it really matter that it's a tiger? That is so odd to me. And tigers aren't even as cute, to be honest, as just domesticated house cats. When they're kittens, they are not as cute. They're kind of derpy looking. <laughs> like they're, not even, they're not even that cute. Just go pet a kitten. This series hopefully will really help pass the Big Cat Public Safety Act. It is creating awareness and consciousness about this issue and the suffering and exploitation of roadside zoos. And I wish Carol could see that because it's doing precisely what her mission advocates for. I really hope this is true. According to him, according to Good, he's uh, spoken with a member of Congress who said the show has actually influenced other members and that they're, it's helping to get enough votes to actually pass it. As far as the, the feud between Carol and Joe, the lawsuit over the, you know, he created Big Cat Rescue Entertainment, <laughs> right, in order to try and get some of her views on the interwebs. I mean, obviously Carol has a right to protect her copyright. Actually going through with it, attaining, obtaining the assets, um, the film kind of, again, they, they seem to be trying to portray it as like she's greedy, as it's wrong to do, you know, interviewing his mom and showing her crying about losing everything or whatever. When Carol says that that's not true, actually, that she did end up suing the mom, but like, the mom, look, the mom is signing all of his stuff. She's putting all of the stuff in her name. She is supporting her son, like what she says in the documentary, like sh her hands are not clean just because she's an old lady. <laughs> she's obviously involved in horrible, nefarious shit. And that's Tiger King. I'm not going to go into detail about all the murder for hire stuff. Like it's just, it's crazy. If you want to see all that stuff, I guess watch it. <laughs> it's not something that I would recommend you know, again, you're, it's just psychopaths and egomaniacs and narcissists and people who have no other options and s some, some mes message about abusing tigers being bad somewhere in there. <laughs> but I do want to end on some, a little bit of kind of light, funny stuff uh, from the show, some stuff I wrote down. This is all from the first episode, I think, because after that it was like, I just, I was not, not even so much like totally tuned in. I mean, I was really like ready for it to be done pretty early on. I didn't find it. Partly that's because I think I'm not a filmmaker or anything, but it's doing like the standard obnoxious documentary shit. And I don't know, just from, in terms of a documentary, I didn't find it terribly entertaining. It was just whatever. They just got lucky with the amazing source material that they landed on, you know, by accident, right? They keep throwing all this stuff at you that honestly, for, I don't know, pretty much the entire time I was watching, I was like, am I even gonna talk about this? I'm probably not even gonna make a video about this because what is this even about? It's not even really about anything to do with anything. <laughs> like, I don't even have anything to say other than, yeah, it's a crazy show. It's not, not, it's not gonna make you feel good. There's no, you know, the, like, what am I even going to talk about? It wasn't honestly until the last few minutes and seeing that clip of Joe where it was like, okay, I want to talk about that. And then it's like, well, I guess I'll talk about this and then blah, blah, blah. But yeah, I only have notes from the first episode because the rest is just, it's a whirlwind. Joe selling Tiger King merch, Tiger King underwear, Tiger King lube in his uh, gift shop. Joe and Doc Antle, the creepy dude in Myrtle Beach that has a bunch of tigers and like an elephant, of course, and he's like riding on the elephant. Ugh, it's just, ugh. Uh, yeah, they, they both refer to tigers as sexy. I don't, yuck. <laughs> this is so gross. I hate it. Oh, I hate it so much. And finally, what is Doc Antle a doctor in? Mystical science. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this subscribe, support the channel, patreon.com slash unnatural vegan, and I will have a new video hopefully very soon. Animal Crossing. Guys, last video, I talked about not being able to get all the fruit because the mystery islands, I think you can only get one other fruit from it and that's it. I still haven't found any others. I've gone to several more islands. Ooh, I hit the money island twice two nights in a row. 
awesome. You get like, I don't know, like 80,000 something, something like that. Close to 100,000, I think. So that was pretty sweet. Uh, yeah, I got all the fruit. I got some friend codes from you guys. Had to figure out how all that works. I realized I had to get a Switch online membership, whatever it's called. They have a seven day free trial. Um, it's not expensive. It's like $20 a year. So that's pretty good. Um, I think it's $4 if you do by month, but if you just pay for the year, it's only 20 bucks. So that's cool. But, uh, yeah, I'm not sure if I'm going to continue that or not. My free trial is up like tomorrow or the next day. It has been fun going to people's islands and seeing like, oh, wow, they're, they know what they're doing. Theirs looks real good. They don't have trees every fucking place. I got too many damn trees. And like shit's organized, you know, I just like, I just put stuff places, especially in my house. I'm like, oh, I like that. And I just set it down. It's like, I'll organize it later. <laughs> and like, I still haven't organized it. It's just shit all over the floor. I just kind of put it like on the edges of the room. <laughs> just random stuff that I like. A lot of you guys have asked me to friend you. I've, I've friended a bunch of people on Switch, but a lot of you I haven't, I haven't gotten to yet. And I'm not sure, you know, if I'm not going to be online, then like, what's the point? But um, if I do end up you know, doing the yearly subscription, then I will try my best to friend everybody that sent me, you know, emails and uh, DMs and whatnot on Twitter. So I will do my best to do that. But yeah, got all the fruit. Flowers too. I think I've got all of them, which I didn't even think about. Um, yeah, I've got the upstairs to my house. Paying that off. Very expensive. I got Flick again. Flick is here today, so I'm going to be playing tonight, getting as many bugs as I can. Waiting for Bunny Day to be over. I'm glad they reduced the number of sky eggs and water eggs. I think that's really all they did. Those were the two that were just crazy, man. I, I swear, it was like 70-30 it was like water eggs to fish. It was absolutely insane. The number of eggs I was getting when fishing. I mean, I can't imagine if you just started the game and you're trying to fish, like it's one of the main ways you're going to make money early on and you just keep getting these stupid eggs. Yeah. So it's been really cool that they've been listening to players and actually changing stuff. I think it's the fourth update. So yeah, that's pretty cool. And yeah, bunny day, it's a Sunday and it'll be over. And I just wish, you know, I just wish the designs were cooler. They're so stupid. All the egg stuff. Like, why does it have to be eggs? Why can't it be like bunnies and butterflies and just different spring Easter type stuff? Why does everything just have to be egg? Like you can still find the eggs. I think that's a cute idea, but having the designs all be egg is just gross. Like the, the final thing you get, or not the final, I guess once you get all of the outfits, the little egg outfits, what it, which I guess are kind of cute. Um, then you get the final egg outfit, which is like this party dress and hat. And that's actually pretty cute, but everything else is just stupid. But the cherry blossoms are amazing. And I've made the little cherry blossom piles. I've made a little cherry blossom bonsai. And I have a little backpack purse thingy. And it, oh my god, it's adorable. It's great. Oh, and the revelation that CJ and Flick partners, partners my ass, dude. Yeah, I had no idea. Maybe that was in a previous one. I don't know. Are Flick and CJ like new to New Horizons? I have no idea. But that was pretty cute when he was talking about his partner that makes art and shit and is like into bugs, but he'll make some fish ones. It's like, oh my God, he's talking about Flick. Partner. Oh, oh my God. You know, I'm watching that Carnival Row with what's her name, who is so, I'm like obsessed with her face. She has the most interesting face and with that little like pixie haircut. Oh my God, she is so cute. It's like, humans and fairies and they're having sex and then it's like there's this ram dude and this white lady and of course the ram's black because it's got to be just totally on the nose but man i think they're totally gonna bang so i'm just getting all sorts of weird furry shit in my life right now and i'm not hating it <laughs> have i said that i was real into uh, the beast and beauty and the beast i'm not a furry i'm really not i don't even understand because they like the real like it, they're real, like more animals, right? Or are they into like, I don't know, but I did have a crush on the beast and I was as a child. 
always disappointed when he changes back into a dude at the end. Because I was like, no, he's ugly. He's not even cute. He's got long hair, which I always hated. Always hated long hair on men. Uh, not today. I mean, whatever. It depends on the face and the hair and everything. But as a kid, it was like, no. And yeah, so that's that's a little something about me. It was the Beast. It was uh, Titan A.E., the Matt Damon character. That was a little bit later, obviously. And it was Billy Zane. In Demon Knight, Jada Pinkett Smith, what were you thinking? What were you thinking? You don't want to be his, like, queen? You don't want to rule the night with Billy Zane? What's the part where he tries to tell her that he loves her? And he's like, I love, I love, I love. I can't quite remember because I, I haven't seen the movie in a very, very long time. I want to say Shock Factory, actually. Uh, did they put out a special thing for Demon Knight? I want to say they did. Oh, my God. What a beautiful man. Okay, I don't remember any of this movie, but there is a scene where Billy Zane just punches through a guy's head. <laughs> He's wearing a cowboy hat, by the way. Pulls the head off and then punches a dude with the head still on his fist. Oh my god, I need to see this movie again.